excited to have everyone join in and tune in. If you want to get your Bibles, iPad, uh, pen, paper, take notes, we would love for you to do so. We are going to continue on with the message that we uh, started last week. I believe this is uh, a message for us right now that is pertinent to us where we are. And uh, I'm excited about getting a chance to deliver this. I just ask for grace to give it the right way in the way God gave it to me. So this morning we're going to jump into it, okay? We, last week we talked about giants, and we talked about the heart of the matter, and that no matter what we go and do throughout our daily lives, our heart it matters. Because heart health, as we know in our country, physical heart health is how many of that's really important. Well, spiritual heart health is just as important as in the natural, as in the spiritual. So it's our responsibility to take care of our hearts to make sure they're good. Because from the Bible says, flows the issues of life, right? And if I have a wrong heart attitude, <laughs> guess what that's going to do? That's going to go out and be a bad heart attitude for somebody else to have to listen to, right? I mean, those are going to keep bad attitudes to ourselves. Okay? They're going to get out, right? Eventually, they're going to work their way out, and somebody's going to say something, and, you, and, and we're exposed that we got something wrong going on inside of us. Okay? So, we talked about giants last week. We're going to continue that this week. We're going to talk about the word deliverance a little bit later on. But this word deliverance is not quite what we think it is. And sometimes we have an idea that deliverance means this. We're going to talk about a different part of that. So, the scripture points from last week were 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. And just to review, David said this to Saul. He said, let no man's heart fail because of him. So David steps up, and the first words he says to his king was an assessment of the situation he was looking at. The uh, armies of Israel were hiding behind rocks. The king was in his tent. Nobody was fighting, right? And David walks in, and his first assessment is, let no man's heart fail him on account of him. So we have a, a heart condition here that men's hearts had failed them. So this was the first battle that they had lost. Now, if you go back and look at uh, Saul's um, history, Saul had had several victories to this point. And for some reason, at this battle, Saul's not engaging, he's not leading his men into battle. So what happened? What was the difference? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a second as well. So people would say that Goliath was the problem. How often do we think that this is the problem, but really this is, this is the problem, right? So they think Goliath wasn't the problem, but the real problem was that Israel had lost their heart. That's true. That's the first fight. If I lose that one, then all the other battles are questionable whether I'll still even engage in that. So my heart, my courage has to stay intact. If not, this fight's over before it ever started. There hadn't been a spear throw, there hadn't been an arrow shot, there hadn't been anything happening except Israel was parading. But there was no getting engaging. What does that mean to us? Sometimes in the church, we can do a lot of parading in the church as the church, but we're not engaging as the church. Amen. Not this church, the church down the road. I can't, okay? But here's the idea. Sometimes we can talk about church. We talk about prayer. Amen. I was in a prayer meeting last week. It was like two and a half hours long. And someone asked me, he says, what did you do for two and a half hours? We prayed. Okay? Well, did anybody speak or about No, We prayed. And they said, what did you pray about? What didn't we pray about? Man. I'm just saying. Okay? So sometimes we can talk a lot about Bible study and talk about the Bible and talk about prayer. But are we engaging? That's the question for us. Okay? So these things are super easy when my heart is full of courage and I stay engaged. That's my key. Okay? How is it that some people conquer the giant and some don't? Why is it some people seem to always be victorious and some people are not? Oh, the thing about it is, my victories are not tied to my talents, my giftings, my personality. None of that is the prerequisite to win battles. Somebody is just not more talented than I am. They have a strong, extroverted personality. That's got nothing to do with it. What goes on for a win is what goes on right here. Amen. This is where we went right here in our heart. Yeah. Amen? Amen? 
Amen. So we can't afford to lose heart or lose courage, okay? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 33, now this is Saul's response to David, okay? He says, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. So <laughs> this is really encouraging right here, right? Okay? And so what happens is you can't afford to take advice from someone who is in a failed heart condition. They're not going to have a proper assessment on whether you can do it or not. So be careful who you share your stuff with and the fight you're going through because if someone you're talking to has got a failed heart condition or is full of discouragement, guess what you're going to get back from them? You're not going to get a whole lot of raw, raw, you can do it, right? right? Okay? So I have to be careful who I receive information from because if I don't, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have people tell me what all I can't do. How many likes to be told what they can't do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> be an honest person, right? Okay. I, I should I tell myself, I was eating Kroger. Can I tell a Kroger story? Okay? And I look down and I'm going the wrong way against the arrows. Okay? And the Bob Seger saw me against the wind and started playing in my head. Okay? I don't know, it felt something kind of good to like go against the grain, right? I'm sorry. Okay. I'll apologize for that later. But anyway, I gotta be careful who I share my stuff with. Okay, the one who has a failed heart is telling the one with an unfailing heart, he can't do it. So that's the reason why we pick those prayer partners, those people of faith, who will see the situation like I do and begin to give me good counsel. Okay? If you want someone to agree with you in prayer, this is just some wisdom, right? If we got someone we want to pray with us and agree with us, let's find someone who's got a good filter or a good lens that they're seeing the situation through. Okay? Like last we said last week, faith does not ignore a problem. Okay? Faith sees a problem. And I think that's gotten some people in trouble in the past when we first got saved and got into this. There was people who say, well, you just ignored every, every symptom, every situation, every condition. You just ignored it and that was faith. It's, it's not true. Faith does not ignore a problem. It sees it. It takes the word of God. It applies it. it you stay in a place of confidence and courage and trust in God's outcome. His promise is true. And everybody listens to life. That's how you stand and you fight, correct? Right? Amen. That's what you do. You have to stand against these kinds of things and stand strong. And the way we do that is through the power of the Word of God. I did the scripture last week. Let me just give that out to those who are taking notes. In Psalms 31 and verse 24, it says, Be strong and let your heart take courage, all who wait upon the Lord. So this word, let your heart take courage. We said the word let last week was a permission word. It means to allow. So I'm the one that chooses whether I stay encouraged or not. It's not dependent on anybody else. It's dependent upon me. I can, I can, take, I can take the cares of this world or I can take courage. That's my responsibility. It's my choice. I choose what I'm going to attach my faith or my courage to. How many of those fear is just as powerful as faith? But faith is just as powerful as fear. I'm choosing which one of those things are allowed to get inside and do what they're going to do with me. I can take faith in, I can take the word in, and allow faith to have a work inside of me to change my heart, to change my mind, my emotions, and change those things, or I can allow fear to come in and it begins to have an effect inside of me as well. It's my choice, okay? Let's move on. Courage or lack of courage sees or views every situation differently. So that's the reason I've said this before. When David walks up on this scene, he sees this whole situation totally different than everybody else does. That's because faith is a lens by which you see situations through. Fear is a lens that you see a situation through. And you can't always trust everybody else's lens, okay? Amen. They're seeing it the way they see it. Okay? But if my, my thoughts are lined up with the Word of God, I'm seeing it the way the Word of God says it. So this is powerful. This will work. This will absolutely work for us if we see things through the proper lens. 
You talk to someone, that's the reason like if you talk to, with someone about a problem you're having. And maybe you're having a problem with someone, and guess what? They're having a problem with the same person. How many of us that's probably not a good combination to talk about? Okay, why? Because you're seeing them through the same lens of a, um, an offense or a past situation or whatever. You need someone who's seen them through the lens that's going to say, hey, listen, let's give some grace here. Let's give some love to that person. Maybe they couldn't love you the way you needed to be or they're not capable of doing that, which I've heard Kimberly say so many times. It's true. I can't afford to look at some situations the way I always do. I need someone else to see it with the lens that's going to pull me back to what the Word of God says. It's, true. it's powerful. You ever had a bad attitude and someone help you work through the bad attitude and you break through into your right mind and realize they're right? Yes. Okay? You can't run off the first emotion you feel. Right? Because we said this last week, we said last week that when you go into this warfare, that your thoughts are going to be the first thing you're going to betray you in a warfare. And then your emotions are going to fall second. And if that's not stopped or checked, it's going to get into your heart. And once it gets into the heart realm, that's where disappointment and discouragement begins to take hold. The worst place to get to is the place of discouragement. You might have ever been there besides me. Okay? I mean, once hope is deferred, it says it makes the heart sick. See how much responsibility we have? We can't, we can't afford to let this heart of ours, the center of who we are, our emotions, our, our seat of courage, our seat of faith, we can't let this thing affect it. Now, my, my thoughts will go everywhere. We were joking earlier before the services. You ought to live in here, okay? You might want to talk about it. I've, I've had thoughts and heard things about the word in the world that come from. Amen? You've got to guard your thoughts because why? They lead to your emotions, which leads to your, your heart, okay? So courage, your lack of courage, sees and views every situation differently. That's the reason why this whole pandemic thing, some people see it a totally different way. I think the church is going to be stronger. I think we're going to be better on the other end of it. We'll see now, Brother Greg, you're just, you know, I'm just saying, I just choose to see that, that somehow, some way, God's going to turn this for the good of our country and for our nation. I choose to see that view. Amen? Amen. And you can disagree with me, just talk to my face, right? <laughs> Let's move on, okay? <laughs> now, I want to get to something really, really important here. Okay, here we go. In verse 35, David now responds to what Saul said, that he could not do this. Okay? So in this verse here, David begins to say something. He says, I went out after him and attacked him, talking about the lion and the bear, and rescued it or the lamb from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Okay? David's now beginning to give, beginning to give his resume. I did this. Okay? Next verse. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. So three times in two verses, David makes mention of himself. Okay? Sounds pretty confident, right? Sounds pretty bold. And part of the answer to that boldness is found right here in the word uncircumcised. David realized that that man did not have a covenant with God. He did. He allowed the mark of God to come on his body. This man has not. He has no covenant. I have covenant. So when you understand covenants, you get pretty bold about things. Right. See, when you understand what's in the covenant that God gave you and gave me, I can be pretty confident and be pretty courageous. Amen. It's not on my authority I'm doing this. It's not on what I think is right and I think is wrong. It's based upon the infallible covenant of God that Jesus' blood sealed and signed for us and then gave us the Holy Spirit is now heaven. Yeah. I'm going to preach myself out there. Nobody else gets there, okay? I'm just saying, this is three times David mentions this. Me, 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 I, I, I. It's pretty bold. But then there's a change of tone. Since he taught the obvious of his God, three times David made reference to himself. Now David says this. He says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the bear 
He will deliver me from this Philistine. Now wait a minute. Was it David who did it or was it God's deliverance? That's the question I have. I'm like, wait a minute, David, you said this was all to you. Now you're saying God delivered you. Why the two mindsets? Why the two statements? Between that, we'll find out what David was saying. Number one, how many has ever felt like that you were the only one going through what you were going through? You were the one who got up and put your clothes on. You're the one who had to shave your face and get out of bed, and you felt like, God, where are you in this anyway? I'm not feeling nothing. How many of you that honest? I mean, you felt like you were gutting this out every minute of every single day, and you could not find God if he was under a magnifying glass. You couldn't find him anywhere. God, you've forsaken me, you've abandoned me, but you get up and go to work simply because that's the right thing to do. I've been there. Probably more often than I care to imagine. I've been there a lot. And I felt like it was all me, me, me for this. Anybody, you know what I'm talking about, right? And then what happens is you get on the other side of it and you realize that you didn't give up, you didn't quit, and maybe that was God's deliverance for you. Could it be possibly that? Okay? Because <laughs> that life is not going to go away. Okay? We can sit back and say, we're going to trust God and life is going to go away. He wasn't going to go away. Amen? In Acts chapter 27, I believe, Paul knew the ship was not going to survive. And he was going to go in the water. He was going to go in that stormy sea, those waves, that wind, that rain. He was going to get wet. He could have very well said, God, I thought you said we were going to get delivered here. You're going in the water. That doesn't sound much like a deliverance to me. Okay? And if you don't know how to, you know how you learn to swim? So you don't drown. <laughs> I know, it's so bad. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, there's things that we do that we think it's all totally me when I realize on the other end, if it had not been for God, it wouldn't have happened. Right. You see? So when you're going through your, your tough time, your giant, your circumstance, your trial, it feels like sometimes you are totally in this by yourself. It's like God has shoved you off of a cliff and just wait for you to hit the, hit the bottom. But in reality, he's either going to teach you to fly or he's going to catch you one or the other. That's the part we don't like. How many likes to do? How many free falling before? One of those rides at Disney to make your stomach go up into your you might have done with us. I don't like the free fall. I weigh too much. Okay? There's that moment in between where there's no gravity and, 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 and there's no force holding you in place, and it's a free fall. Don't care for that too much. Okay? Except when you're out the highway of El Grado and you go with that one hump there and you like that coming. <laughs> now put your stomach out. So David, so anyway, so David did David do this or did God bring deliverance? Let me read something to you. About this, about this right here. Okay? During your fight, you thought or felt like you were doing it all. It was your sweat, your effort. It was you and you alone. But afterwards, you realized that by not quitting, that was a form of deliverance. I think in our country, in our church world, we sometimes think of deliverance that God's going to rescue us and pull us out of everything. And us never have to walk through anything. I think that mindset's crept into the church in America where God's going to rescue me. And there's about four or five different definitions for the word rescue. And one of them means, one of the word rescue means, definitions for deliverance means to rescue. So was the rescue he took the situation away from me or was the rescue I did not, was, I did not go into discouragement? Was that the true rescue? Not that he took the situation away from me. Not that I didn't have to walk through the waters, through the fire, through the valley of the shadow of death. That wasn't the rescue. The rescue was I did not lose heart in the midst of those situations. I think that's the bigger rescue. That God just doesn't part the waters and we just walk through on dry land every single time. Can he do that? Yes. 
Has he done that? Yes. Did he leave some giants in the land for me to fight? For me to conquer? And no one can conquer him for me. I've got to face my pride. I've got to face my fear. I've got to face my uh, fear that I'm not going to be loved. I'm not going to be cared for. I can face all those fears that we all face, those different giants we face. And some of those things God will not remove out of your way. He left them there for you to kill. That's a real prosperity message, isn't it? But it's true. He left this giant in the land for David to kill. So the deliverance from a situation based simply was that I did not lose heart. I kept my courage. I knew somehow, some way, God was going to take me through it. Even though when I didn't see any result. I think that's the one of the strongest deliverances we can have. Why? God did 10 miracles in the life of Israel when he brought them out of Egypt, right? And how many of those they still questioned him as to whether or not they were in the right place at the right time? In other words, miracles are great. Miracles are wonderful. Miracles help move uh, the gospel forward. But oftentimes through the history of man, miracles do not hold us very long. Right. And we're looking for another one. And uh, we're looking for another validation. Or could it simply be that we faced that giant and we did not back down, we did not back off, it was full steam ahead. Maybe that's the stronger deliverance. Because what does that do? That builds my faith on a whole different level than just seeing a miracle all the time. So we're not downplaying miracles, but we can't exalt them to a place where that's all we're looking for. I'm looking for something to do with my faith. And when I have to walk this thing out, when David had to walk out the lion and the bear, he had a resume before Saul. Here's what I did. Here's what I did. And God delivered me. And this giant's going to be the same as what those two were. The outcome is not going to be any different. That's some confidence. That's some courage. That's the stuff I want. Okay? Because once your, once your testimony becomes your testimony, it is yours. And it's powerful. You might want to talk about it. Amen. It's not someone else's testimony, it's yours. It's not what we heard happen somewhere. And, and I, I heard an awesome testimony the other day about, uh, I, sh I think I shared this with someone, that uh, a woman who was uh, delivered from, uh, from cutting, that uh, she went to the altar and, and she got saved and, and God delivered her. And when she pulled her sleeves up to see where the scars were, the scars were gone. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Talk about some deliverance. Even the scars of her past were gone off of her arm. That's a miracle. Yes. That's awesome and that is amazing. Yes. Try, to convince, try to convince her that that did not happen. It's not going to work. Can you imagine trying to convince Lazarus that God does not raise the dead? And, it, and, and, it, and the scribes and Pharisees saw at least three people be raised from the dead during, during Jesus' ministry, and they still didn't believe who he was. This is powerful. This is important. Because this is what happens inside of me. I see it with my own eyes. I hear it with my own ears. Deliverance has several definitions. We've already talked about this. One is the word rescue today. The mentality of rescue means to remove. What does deliverance look like? You say, well, I got delivered. What does it look like? You ever wondered that? Someone would say, I got delivered. Okay, what does that, what does that look like? What does it mean to be delivered? It's God giving you the opportunity to kill the giant that you're dealing with. That's what deliverance looks like. It's not talking about killing it. It's about going out and killing it. It's not talking about being rid of fear and anger. It's actually bringing that thing to a place where I begin to kill it. Amen? And, and so here, let me, here's, here's the gauge for fear. Maybe I, it's not that fear totally has left my life. Maybe I don't get as afraid as I used to as often or to the degree. That's deliverance. That's deliverance in process, isn't it? Where I'm going to a place of fright and terror, it doesn't put me in bed, I still make me have it, but I still get up, I still function. That's a deliverance. 
That's powerful, right? What do we do? We build a resume so one day you walk free and you realize, huh, I didn't have to face that job in a while. And it's a process of deliverance to do that microwave, hands-on, oil, you know, flying everywhere, breakthrough stuff. It could be that you walk this out. That's still deliverance, okay? Deliverance is that you that your heart did not fail this time. You didn't go to a place of discouragement this time. Whatever the situation is, normally where you would get discouraged, now it's not as discouraging as it used to be. Now you've transferred more and more hope to God, and there's less room, less and less room for discouragement to work. That's deliverance, okay? Deliverance was that you did not quit. My deliverance is, is that I totally took the word quit out of my vocabulary because I'm not going to quit. There may be some fights I fight as long as I'm on this earth. But it won't be because I stopped fighting. Matter of fact, the closer you get to defeating something, <laughs> sometimes the stronger it gets, isn't it? Amen. you got to realize that. Okay? Deliverance is not always a rescue out of the situation, but the rescue comes... Um, but a rescue from heart failure. We've already talked about that. Maybe the surgery did not happen this time. Maybe we get to a place where instead of uh, a fear and anxiety and worry, I realize, you know what? I've trained myself to release this to God and give it to Him. That's the training process where it doesn't take me hold and pull me completely under like you see. You may bob up and down, <laughs> but you're not going to see. Right? So I think sometimes we get this idea of deliverance where God just comes in and just boom. And that's wonderful when that happens. But I've seen in my own life, I've walked some more of this out, and I've seen stuff happen like that. But what does it do? It makes you stronger for next time. Okay? The end result, we're going to talk about the rest of this next week. We're going to maybe, maybe wrap it up next week. One of the, the out, outcomes of David killing this giant was he trained men to go kill giants as well. His mighty men of valor went on to kill four more giants. David didn't have to go kill those guys. He trained someone else how to do it. See that? Because when you get victory over depression, you have your victory over anger, fear, lust, whatever it may be, when you gain your victories, you've got something now to help train someone else on how to do it. It takes a lot of training to get me good enough for the sling and a rock to kill a giant. A lot of training. In my hands, that, that weapon wouldn't work. But in David's hands, it was a knockout blow. See? So we gotta train people. Train people. Hey, listen, here's how God brought me through. Yeah, but did you have to sweat and did you have to just make yourself? Yes. I did. But it was all a part of God's deliverance. It felt so alone. It felt hard. It felt difficult to even get up and sit up on the side of the bed. But I did it anyway. Why? Because God was delivering me. And that's how you walk people through some of the stuff they're walking through. Did my emotions just fall in line? No. Did my thoughts just fall in line? No. But my heart didn't fail. See? That's the center of who we are. So this morning, I hope this has helped. Helped you face your job. Help you face that thing that someone else looks at and goes, oh, that's, that's a small thing. But to you, it's big. Have you ever had anybody make fun of what you're facing? Or make light of it? Oh, well, that's nothing. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's something to me. Or I would, be, well, I would be free from it, right? So we can't take each other's, uh, you know, trials or circumstances or what they're facing and, 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 and bring them down to being nothing because they're very, very real. Goliath was real. Fear is real. Depression is real. Anger issues are real. And for someone to say, oh, that's no big deal. Thank you. Appreciate your encouragement there. It's something I gotta walk through. Does that make sense?
So this morning, let's wrap this up. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to stay away from a, a discouraged heart. And Father, we do that by taking your word. We download it into our heart and mind daily. And every thought that tries to rise itself up against your knowledge, we cast that thing down. We pull that down. It's got no place in exalting itself against the knowledge of God. This may feel like this is a myth by myth thing. It may be an hour by hour thing, but I'm not going to quit. I'm going to continue to pull that thing down that's exalting itself. Frustration is not going to rule my life. I choose to walk in peace. Why? Because I walk in courage. Father, you give us the ability to believe and have faith. And we attach it to your word. We attach it to your character. We attach it to your nature. That your word is absolutely true. And every other report is subject to change. We choose to believe the report of the Lord. That you are stronger than anything I face. And you are empowering me to face my stuff. Even though it feels like I'm the one doing it, even though it feels like I am just all alone in this whole thing, it's a part of your deliverance. It's a part of your rescue. That you have me and you will not let me fall. He'll bear you up. So, this thing I'm facing, the situation I'm facing with its finances, with its health, whatever it may be, my first thought is that I stay in a place of courage. I do not let my faith get weak. I stay strong in you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. If you uh, watch the live stream at home, give us a thumbs up, and we'll see you next week.